the men are, are having a um, October 14th gathering here um, in the dining room, and it's a potluck at six six o'clock. Of course, you know, masks and distance and trying to make sure as much as possible to, uh, to help each other stay safe, but still also be together as much as we can as well. Are there others? Seeing, seeing none, let's uh, turn our hearts to God for worship. like a gang sign, you know, 
I'm a Christian. Oh, I'm a Christian too. And so it was a little, and then they could, of course, just uh, wipe it out, you know, and no one knows any better. But it was a way for, uh, uh, I am told when I was young, that it's a way to, um, to, to speak about uh, like being a Christian and, and maybe even showing which way the meeting was, which way the fish was facing. I don't know. But the fish uh, was probably a symbol for Christianity before the cross was. And uh, the cross um, is now fundamentally what we look at. And like if you're a Coptic Christian and you get um, a, a tattoo that says you're a Christian, which they give them, I think, when they're pretty much born to say, you were born a Copt, um, they, uh, uh, it's a cross. But you've known people also that get the fish. And uh, so, for, if you're a little child at home and you want to try this, or you're a grown-up, this is an easy, easy one to do. As simple as that. And, and you know, things need to be simple sometimes. They don't need to be more complicated. The thing about a fish is Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. And the idea that we are to tell others this good and show others this good way of Jesus Christ. And we can all school together and we will be, uh, and so the fish is a symbol. One of the reasons for it is, um, is the teaching from the Bible where Jesus says, I will make you fishers of men. So there you are, a fish, really easy. Uh, I think anybody could pretty much do this. All right.
headed on from 7.30 to 9, and they showed people doing race for the cure, virtually everybody doing their individual walks, and people still donating <coughs> online. And then instead of wearing my t-shirt, pink, um, and my mom is 19 years out this year. We're grateful. My concern would be for all those still in treatment, and I know there are other members of the congregation who are also survivors, but I won't I won't <coughs> name them. But also those people still um, in treatment and people you know who have passed away from it. And my mother has lost several friends since her diagnosis. Um, along the way, and so I would, I said it's a joy and a concern both. So hopefully next year we will be downtown with 20,000 other people like we have for I think, I think we've done it 18 years. I think we missed one year, but otherwise we would be downtown with 20,000 other people. So Sally, with Race for the Cure and cancer survivors, particularly breast cancer in particular, but all cancers we know is something that we deal with in our families and in our church, one of the health conditions that's a big, big deal. So we are grateful for your life and we pray for, indeed, for people to live long and healthy lives. Yes, Ruth. Um, well, it's kind of a joy and a, and a concern. I it's just a joy that I have my family, and I sometimes I don't think about the people that don't have their family around them, um, especially my neighbor Lisa, whose mother died uh, a couple weeks ago alone. She didn't have a relationship with her. She is now out of town because her dad has fallen, so she's there with him. And we had our family over yesterday for a hobo dinner outside, and so her. Her husband's dad lives across the street, and he is alone. <laughs> and so he came over and had dinner with us. Um, but we also want to pray for him. He had um, a large melanoma removed from his back, but he told us last night that now he has a couple um, spots under his arm and a lymph node, and probably going to have to have more surgery on that. So we want to pray for Fred. Thank you, Ruth. And I thank you for bringing up um, those of us who are living alone, of which there are a number of us. And, uh, and in a partnered world, um, it can be overlooked. And, uh, and, and sometimes a, a bad or difficult partnership, it's better to be alone. Yes. Truly, there are times. But many times it is also very difficult to be alone. So thank you for that. Are there other joys or concerns? Seeing none, I'm going to mention a few. I want you to know again, uh, the Reverend Dr. Joy is, uh, is, is still having quite intense health difficulties, and we pray for her as she is in, um, in decline. And we pray for Kathy and Aldana, who have both been in the hospital and are both um, doing better, but still um, need our love and prayers. And if anyone else joined me in sending cards to, to Kathy, that's wonderful because last I checked, she was still in the hospital. Um, we thank God for Eduardo. Um, we pray for the Sylvania Baha'is, our sister. We remember um, Zion Church, where my wife is serving in New York. And, um, and we pray and indeed we remember Race for the Cure. So with those things in mind, let's pray. And then conclude with the Lord's Prayer in the traditional way we're giving it. We are giving it in the New Testament, which uses the word Father. Of course, we know God is love, God is light, God is spirit. God is Father, God is Mother, God is uh, salvation. Let's pray. Uh, spirit of God, as we gather today, what a joy to be six feet away from each other, nearer to each other than we've been all week. How good it is to be with people that we love and people who love us. We thank you that we are surrounded uh, by, by caring 
and, and honest people. And we thank you that here at our church, we have a safe place and a home where human as we are with our faults and failures, we're also beautiful and loving and caring and forgiving. So God help us as family and as a church to look out for each other and take care of each other and help each other. We thank you that you never leave us or forsake us. You are always with us. And we know that you wish for everywhere there to be honesty, uh, light, uh, clarity, uh, truth. We know everywhere we wish you wish for there to be spirit or life uh, in all of its abundance and fullness and that everyone have as much opportunity to live fully and richly as possible. And we know as God, as love, that you want us to be in, in wholesome, helping relationships with you and with one another. We pray in, uh, for those of us who are sick. We rejoice in those in the new baby, uh, Eduardo. We rejoice in your love for us. We pray for our nation which is going through an election process, which is often very painful for us, and this time is no different. Uh, so we pray for the, the, the maintaining of our, of our democracy and our, and our future, we hope and pray for um, our land. And we pray for all the nations of the world because you are God over all things, and we pray for your realm to come on earth as it is in heaven, a realm of justice and peace and kindness and forgiveness and cooperation and understanding and we put ourselves at your service as your children as followers of Jesus Christ to be in this uh, vision for the future. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. generously in the mission of Christ in our community and in our world.
present these gifts in the name of Jesus. Amen.
So one of the ways to think about your life is it's relationships everywhere. It's relationships everywhere. Your relationship with your spouse, if you're blessed with a spouse, with your children, with your neighbors, with your country, your relationship with truth and falsehood, your relationship with God and Jesus, these are all relational. It's relationships everywhere. With quantum entanglement, they say we're all connected somehow. And you know, the biology of it is that, um, that the hydrogen and oxygen and, you know, and the stuff we breathe, we inhale and exhale. So even though we're keeping six feet apart from each other, uh, we've been around each other enough that we probably have some atoms that have uh, found their way into each other because we've known each other for a few years. And some people have done the, the work and they've said, Jesus Christ living 30 some years on the earth and we change our, our mass like every you know, seven years, we replace ourselves or something and that adds up to so many pounds of Jesus diffused through the world. And so there's actually probably in every one of us a molecule or a, a hydrogen or an oxygen or a carbon or something from, that actually was in Jesus at one time in us. So hooray! But same true for Hitler. So, responsibility, responsibility, to be more like Jesus and less like Hitler, that's a pretty good way to go. So, um, let me tell you from Philippians, Paul's advice to be like Jesus, because Jesus is our, the author and finisher of our faith, he is called. He is called the, um, the A to Z, you know, the author and finisher. He takes us from beginning to end. And we have the, the story of Jesus, the, the footprints on the sand, and we like that story so much because it is that Jesus does not abandon us, but like, like it says in the end of Matthew, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I will never leave you or forsake you. And these are scriptures I often share with people before they go into surgery because that's the time when you know, when you, they put you under. You don't know if you'll ever wake up again. You hope you do, but every once in a while somebody doesn't. And so it's like you're facing death. And so at that moment, it's good to know that Jesus is with you and hasn't abandoned us. So Jesus is the author and finish of our, finisher of our faith. He's the alpha and omega of our way. He is the way, truth, and life. He shows us the way. He is the way. And he walks beside us and with us along the way. And so we are not just um, uh, saying what a great guy Jesus was. We're also saying that we are an imitation of his life. We're, his life is a model for our lives. And if we believe that and live that, we're being true to what the New Testament teaches. Here in uh, Philippians, Paul says, um, don't look out for, uh, look out for each other's interests, not just for your own. The attitude you should have is the one that Christ Jesus had. And that says he was in the nature of God, but he did not think that, that by force he should try to become equal with God. He didn't try to stay up there and separate and um, instead of this, um, of his own free will, he gave up all he had and took the nature of a servant. And so this in the Greek is kenosis, the self-emptying. It's the, the way of God is, is humble and inclusive and, and um, is a, the way up is down first. So instead of this, um, of his own free will, he emptied himself. Uh, became the nature of a servant. He became a human. He appeared in human likeness. He was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death, even death on a cross. And um, for this reason, God raised him to the highest place among uh, above and gave him the name that's greater than any other name. And so we have this journey that of, of self-emptying, and then God filling and restoring. And so the, the words are uh, kenosis emptying and theosis divinization or, or blessedness or resurrection or vindication. So it's theosis, it's the crucified life, it's, 
It's laying down our own life. It's realizing that other people are just as real as we are and deserve to breathe the air as much as we do and to wear shoes and to do the things that people need to do to be happy and to be well and to be safe and to be respected just like we want that for ourselves. So should we want it for all other people. And we should not consider any privileged or exalted place something to be defended, but we should understand that we are servants and we are here to make the world a good place for as many people as we can. The very same good things we want for ourselves. Now, I am not saying that this is just about this life. I am not denying the enormity of the question of death and life after death. I'm just saying this life does also matter to God and to us. And it mattered so much to Jesus that according to this text, instead of just hanging out where he was, he joined us where we were. And so, um, and so let's talk about that life again, saying what's the meaning of you? What's your meaning at Heilman? What's your meaning? In this um, meditation for many years now, I have, I have looked at, um, at my responsibility, and I think your responsibility to, to, these, um, to this kenosis, theosis, to acts of mercy and acts of justice, and then God's vindication and blessing. So I'm, I'm going to suggest that there's a responsibility we have when we're alone, there's a responsibility we have when we see someone in need. There's a responsibility we have when we see an injustice. And there's a responsibility we have when God blesses us. And it's interesting because you can actually see churches that orient themselves around each one of those things as their fundamental um, part. Some churches um, are, are very much about making sure you're safe when you die. Some churches are very much about let's celebrate and offer God the sacrifice of praise right now. Let's let the blessing come. Holy Spirit come. Let's have a party. Some are about I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. Let's do the things that need to be done so people can get what they need. And then some are about justice. This is about racism. This is about poverty. This is about marching on the streets. And you can see these, these, uh, these kinds of churches. And what I'm saying is they're all right, but they're not all in all. It, all in all is all four of the things together. But they come at their own different times. So if you ask a general question, you get a general answer. But you don't live your life generally. You live your life specifically. And so the specific question is, um, what is your duty? What is your responsibility? What is your meaning when you're alone? <coughs> so the, the the idea that we have a, a public life, a private life, a secret life. What happens when we're alone? One of the things that can happen, and this is something that centering prayer and the monastic life is about, and there are not too many churches like that, but there are some, and that is uh, that it is the, the time like Jesus to go out into the wilderness and fast and pray and, and meet the devil within so that when you meet the devil without, you don't act like a devil, but you truly can be a healer. Um, and so spending the time to open one's heart to God as a practice is a responsibility that you could take up when you're by yourself. And so um, my, my joke as an older man is that... Uh, Having to get up at four in the morning to go to the bathroom is my call to prayer. <laughs> right? So when you wake up and you're all alone and the house is quiet, unless the dog is barking, um, then, then it could be an opportunity, even an invitation, to come and pray. 
Do you believe God loves you and wants to, these intimate times with you? Do you believe God would, um, would wake you up in the middle of the night? Or, or when you wake up, could you imagine that your love is whispering in your heart ear? The practice of opening one's heart and emptying oneself is the primary practice that helps us open our heart and, em and empty ourselves and all the other circumstances in life so that we're not so full of our own thoughts that we can hear the thoughts of others, so that we're not so full of our own lives that we can hear the lives of others, so we're not so full of ourselves that we can be like Jesus and care about other people, not just about ourselves. So our responsibility is to be self-emptying. And then I was hungry and you, and you gave me something to eat, acts of mercy. We, we need to not um, close our eyes to the needs of others, thinking someone else will take care of them. Who is my brother's keeper? Who is my sister's keeper? Not me. I, you know, it's like they ought to, you know, they should have they should have looked, they should have looked before they crossed the street. You know, they should have done something different. It's kind of their fault. They made their bed, they can sleep in it. But sisters and brothers, have you not known mercy in your life? I, I love the saying I've heard, uh, how are you doing? And the answer I've, I've heard given is better than I deserve, right? <laughs> I've heard some people say that from time to time. And it's, it's recognition that we are recipients of mercy. It would be unfair of us not to extend mercy to others. And Jesus doesn't, uh, doesn't ask for um, us to, to run an, uh, an assessment. He just says, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was in prison and you visited me. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. And they just said, well, we weren't. When did we see that? And so people aren't, aren't, aren't trying to score points with God, but they just see a need and they just can't help but do something good. And there are churches like that. And in fact, our church should be like that. Every church should be like that. And that is that we should be a place where we care for each other and we care for our neighborhood. But then that's not all. Um, acts of justice matter. And you see, this is the difference. Um, that This is what got Jesus killed. You see, if Jesus had just gone out into the wilderness and, and wrestled with the devil and, you know, the temptations, and he'd have gotten his, you know, enlightenment or that I am the Son of God, and he could have just stayed out there and just enjoyed it. You know, just, just enjoyed it and not gone back in with the messiness of being with people. But that was, that's just the beginning. He went to be with the messiness of people. And people were messy, and people were sick, and people had troubles. And he let himself get all in the middle of that. And he healed people, and he cast out devils, and he got stuck in between people. As they said, divide, help me and my brother divide up our property, and all these kinds of things he got involved in. And it was beautiful. And he said, I, and he touched the leper that he wasn't supposed to touch. And he healed people on the Sabbath day that he wasn't supposed to heal because it was the Sabbath day. And he said to the women, sit here with the men, it's fine, there's nothing wrong with that, you've chosen the better thing. And he welcomed the children to come when they said, no, it's a grown-up thing. And he welcomed the Gentiles, and so even though it was sometimes a test, the point is, if that is all he had done, he wouldn't have been crucified. And so it's the same way. A church is not enough if it's just about... How do I surrender my life to God and follow Jesus Christ? How do I open my heart to God right here and now? It's not enough just to say, when I see a need, I shall empty myself and show mercy. And it's, it's an, it, we need to also take the next step, which is the, um, the confrontation against the systemic problems. In his case, it was that, that public demonstration of that walk into Jerusalem, Palm Sunday, which was like a protest march in a way. It was a, a, a demonstration which was um, the authorities frankly didn't like. Uh, they were like, tell your disciples to be quiet. <laughs> See, you can demonstrate, but not like that. And so then, um, and then he went to the temple and he threw over the money 
coffee changers tables and he scattered, you know, sent the animals out and uh, he made a, a, and he said that my house is supposed to be a house of prayer for all people. You have made it a den of robbers. And, um, and that got him killed. Within one week, he had been betrayed by an informant. He had been arrested, disappeared at night, and given a trial before people even knew what they were going to have for breakfast. And then he was publicly humiliated. He was tortured and then terror murdered by the authorities. That's what crucifixion is. It was a demonstration of, 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 of being able to cruelly destroy people because it was for the Romans to teach a lesson, don't mess with us or we will do this to you. That's looking at Jesus' life that way. But Jesus' death on the cross was more than that because Jesus' death on the cross, while being all of that, was also some way a carrying of God in solidarity into our difficulties. It was solidarity with, um, with all of us in our weakness, all of us in our challenges. And according to the Apostles' Creed, he descended into hell and was raised up on the third day. And so we even have the, the idea that Jesus went from the highest heaven to the lowest pit and back to the highest heaven again, therefore making a complete journey and filling every part of the universe with divine presence. And so that this was what we're supposed to do is bring God's presence with us, whatever we do. But then it doesn't stop there. There's resurrection and ascension. And that's the blessedness. And I thank God for that. But there's uh, the thing is, um, when you're alone, you can always spend sweet time with God and open your heart and say yes to God. When you see a need, you can do something about it, an act of mercy. When you see an injustice, you can say something or do something. What do you do with resurrection or blessedness? I think the correct thing to do is to enjoy it, to be grateful for it, to to wallow in it, because isn't there enough time of suffering, worry, and horror in the world? Isn't it nice when you get um, a break and lift it up from time to time? If you're a grandmother and you make your, your children lasagna, you know, and, and you sit them down for a big old meal, what do you want them to do? You want them to enjoy it. And so I'm suggesting this isn't all work and suffering here. There's also a lot of joy. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He, he shows us the way. He is the way. And he walks beside us along the way. And that we don't need to ask, what is the meaning of life? Instead, Life, in a sense, asks, what is the meaning of you? And it's not a general question, because that can't be answered. But it is, what are you going to do right here, right now? May God help us all live the fullest, richest, deepest way of Christ.
Jesus. There is no one else like you. And your life has meaning because there's nobody else that can be you but you. And you are a part of God's realm, a child of God. And what you do is important and has meaning. And you can find it and you can do it. And when we fall short, if God is full of mercy and let us all be full of mercy towards ourselves and one another. And let us be God's people in this world. George? And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.